Okay, hello everyone. This is Dr. Ross back with chapter seven of our Chem 65 or introductory chemistry course. The contents of today's um, slides is we're gonna look at energy. So this is the thermochemistry chapter of our course. We're looking at, gonna look at energy. We're gonna introduce heat and work. We're gonna talk about enthalpy. Uh, We'll talk about including enthalpy in our stoichiometric calculations. We'll mention Hess's law and finally formation reactions. Okay, so without further ado, so thermochemistry um, is the study of okay. Thermochemistry involves the chemistry of heat. So whenever we have a chemical process, heat is involved. Um, so, and the beeping you can hear is somebody trying to come into the class. So let me add this person. Okay, so thermochemistry is the chemistry of heat uh, involved, during involved during chemical reactions. And we know that heat can flow between a system and a surrounding. So for example, this is something I always got confused with when I was confused by when I was a student. So I don't want you to be confused the way I was. There are two objects. There is a system. The system is whatever you decide it is. If you're a physician, the system is your patient. If you're the mayor of a large city, the system is the city. If you're the head of your household, the system is your family. You choose what the system is. If you're doing uh, a lab on a bench, the beaker in front of you is the system. If, if it's not the system, it must be the surrounding. So everything that's not the system, we call the surrounding. Okay, and we can have an exchange of information into and out of the system from the surrounding. Okay, that flow of information could be heat, it could be work, it could be anything, but we have a flow of information. If we look at the entirety of our two objects, we can call it one name, we can call that the universe. So he, here's the confusion, there are three names universe, surrounding, and system, but there's only two objects because the universe describes the two objects. So it's not a third object. It's not the system, the surrounding, then the universe. The system and the surrounding are the universe. Um, okay, so I wanted that to be clear because it was not clear to me when I was a student. Okay, um, so for example, if the system is a fire, heat will flow into the surrounding out of the fire. If the system is a block of ice, heat will flow from the surrounding into the system to melt the ice, uh, et cetera. And if we look at the universe, which is everything going on, we have conservation of energy, which strictly only applies to the universe because it looks at everything, all the materials that lose energy, all the materials that gain energy, it looks at everything, and there's no net change in that energy. Okay. So there's an idea that's similar to the conservation of mass law called the conservation of energy law. So you can literally just replace the word mass with the word energy and you get conservation of energy. That is not the first law of thermodynamics. So it, it's misleading here. The first law of thermodynamics is this statement in the box. So the first law of thermodynamics is this equation here. The Conservation of energy law is a broadly, it's a broad applicable law that says energy can't be created or destroyed. Underneath the conservation of energy law, you have the first law of thermodynamics, which says that the change in total internal energy, U, is the sum of work and heat. So W is work, uh, Q is heat. This is a subset of conservation of energy. Okay, what is total internal energy U? Um, well, you can think of it as the sum of 
potential energy and kinetic energy. So kinetic energy is the energy when an object moves. Potential energy is the energy an object has based on its location. So if you stand, um, you know, if you stand on a stool, you have a different potential energy than if you don't stand on a stool. You know this because you can fall off the stool. You can't fall off not the stool. And so you can feel that difference in potential energy when it's cashed out and converted to kinetic energy. OK, so total internal energy just measures all the energy in the system. We can access that energy as work and heat. Typically, work is the desired product of internal energy. Heat is usually the byproduct that we don't want. For example, if you put gasoline in your car, the gasoline has some internal energy, and you want to convert that into the mechanical motion of your wheels so you can get from point A to point B. You don't want that energy to be converted to heat to make your engine hot. Right, that's a byproduct. Yes, you can use it to heat your car up if your car's cold, for example, but it's really a byproduct. The intention of a car is not to get hot. The intention of a car, the objective of a car is to move, right? Not to get hot. Um, so heat is usually an unwanted byproduct. All right. Uh, system and surroundings, I think we mentioned that already. Again, you, the scientists, choose what the system is. It's your area of focus. I mean, literally, as you look at the screen now, if you look at the word system, the word system is in focus and everything else, you're aware of it, but it's in the surrounding. That's kind of the same um, as the system and surrounding. We've talked about he can go in and out. Typically, we talk with respect to the system. So if ever we say there was a loss of energy and we don't say whether it was the system or surrounding, you can assume it was the system. For example, and th hopefully this should be as common sense as the following. If you are a physician or if your doc, if your physician, your doctor says to you, hey, um, you have a fever, you immediately assume your body has a fever, not the room you're in has a fever, right? The doctor doesn't say your body has a fever. Not, not the room, I just want to make that clear. No, you assume that they mean you. Likewise, chemists and scientists in general, we assume you're talking about the system unless you tell us you're not talking about the system. Um, energy is always positive, so we have to be very careful. We can have pluses and minuses going around here. They talk about the direction. So for example, if the system gains work, we talk about positive work. If the system gains heat, we talk about positive heat. However, if the system loses heat, we talk about negative heat. It's still a positive object. It's just moving away from us. So with respect to us, it's negative because it's moving away. I'm losing heat if it's negative. It's still a positive object. I'm losing work if it's negative, but it's still a, uh, a negative object. It's still a positive object. And that just reminded me, I want to go back to the previous slide real quick. I want to make more of a stink about this equation because this can cause a whole host of issues, um, especially if you're a type of student that fishes around on YouTube for videos. Uh, you don't know what you're getting if you do that. Okay, so this is the way it's written here, and this is the way most people write it. I'm going to annotate it a little bit. So really what's missing the way it's written here, the heat can be plus or minus and the work likewise can be plus or minus, right? Those two objects, they're always added together, but those objects themselves can be plus or minus. So the addition sign in the middle is a verb, do this action on these arguments. The plus and minus next to the variables, they are up there. Um, they belong to the object, right? So what would that be in English? They're not verbs, they are adjectives. Yeah, I think it's an adjective. When you describe a noun, you're an adjective, right? So because of this, you can have equations that can confuse students. So you can see stuff like this. You might have 
W minus Q. And the student's like, oh no, in my notes it says plus Q, and now they're saying minus Q. Well, it's just because you're adding a negative Q, that's all. Or you can have delta U um, is Q minus W, and then you're like, what? I, I memorized this thing, that's not what it says in my notes. Nope, it's just because you've got a positive Q and a minus W, you add them together, it looks like Q minus W. So if you start to see funny business like this, just remember, it's always the addition of work and heat, but the heat and work can be coming in and out of the system. So you can have that double negative or the negative and a positive. That, um, so just be, be wary of that. Can cause problems for no reason. Okay. So um, I'm actually, uh, well, yeah, we'll talk about that in a second. So work, um, work has units of energy, heat has units of energy. And this is a, an equation probably uh, useful enough to us uh, here. So work is forced by distance. And again, I'll probably post a video on energy after this for my students at least. Um, and I can't remember if I derived this or, or not. But anyway, work is forced by distance. So if you take an object that is applying a gravitational force because of its mass, and you want to move it, like let's say you want to drag a wooden box across the floor at distance d, you're going to have to do work to do that. And you can measure that based on the force that the object is exerting and the distance that you want to travel. So obviously, the further, the farther you want to drag the object, the more work you're going to do. So that's a very instinctive way of thinking of work. Um, the work that's going to be useful to us in this class is going to be related to gases. So when a gas is produced as a product in a chemical reaction, it immediately manifests surrounded by atmospheric pressure. So that gas has to expand to push the atmosphere away from it, and it does work on the atmosphere. Um, Pressure uh, is force per unit area. So we can combine those two equations uh, to have work is pressure by change in volume. The minus sign here is just a, a definition. So this minus sign here is just a convention. It just means with respect to the system. So. If the volume increases, the system has done work, so you get a negative value. So it's just a convention. It's not, it's not a real negative. It's just a convenient tool that allows us to talk about the system naturally. What's important is the product P delta V. So if you're a bit fuzzy where this is coming from, we know from our gas chapter that PV is NRT. This is the ideal gas law. All right, if I want to isolate um, um, well, if I want to, let's see, if I've got uh, pressure is force P unit distance. Yeah, pressure is force P unit distance. Okay. Um, well, I mean, if you just look at the units, I knew that PV has units of what? Atmosphere and volume. So atmosphere, liter. Um, actually, I need more space than this. Let me, I'm trying to show you that PV is an energy unit. That's what I'm trying to do. So let me get the eraser, which is that one. I guess the way I'd have to show you that is okay so there's an equality i'm gonna have to use um so there's a definition that 101.33 joules is one liter atmosphere 101.33 it might be 101.35 but anyway it's definitely 101.3 something so 
Lita atmosphere is a unit of energy. So when we have pressure times by volume, instinctively, we know that's a unit of energy. Okay. Um, so I instinctively know that PV uh, is a unit of energy. I know that work is a unit of energy, so I can set them equal to each other. And I know that PV is NRT. Let me erase that a little bit. All right, I know that PV is NRT, but what about P change in volume? Well, I can put the change wherever I like. Well, I, it's not appropriate to put it next to the constant because constants don't change. So I can either have a change in temperature or a change in moles. So I can arbitrarily decide to put the change wherever I like. I'm gonna put it on moles, as long as I have a change somewhere. So that's what's chosen here. Um, again, so if I fix the temperature, I can look at the fluctuation of moles. If I fix the moles, I could look at the fluctuation of temperature, no big deal. But this is where this is coming from, this delta NRT. Um, again, the negative sign is a convention so that we always talk about the system. But what's crucial is the product PV. Oh, it's right down here. Oh my goodness, I'm so, so unobservant. <laughs> <laughs> didn't even see it. All right. So it's definitely uh, 101.33. There you go. Um, very observant. Of me. That's too funny. Okay. All right. So I'm going to try and get that next slide. Okay, so heat, most people, and I think with my class this week, I've given an assignment asking for the difference of heat and temperature. Uh, so I'll be interested to see what, what people write for that. Most people say they know what the difference is, but then they get confused. So maybe to help with that assignment, if you're watching this video and you probably sat down in a chair, if you're not, sat down in a chair with metal on it. If you go find some metal and with your left hand, grab a piece of metal. And with your right hand, grab something that's not metal. So I have a hat. I've got this hat here that's made of, I don't know, nylon or something flammable, I'm, I'm assuming. So it's not metal. And then I'm gonna grab something that is metal like the chair I'm sat on. And then you ask yourself, which is colder, the metal or the non-metal? Most people would agree that the metal is colder and most people would be wrong. They're the same temperature, the metal just feels colder. So your brain is getting input and it's desperately trying to understand that input. And based on your experience of temperature, you lead your brain into the wrong conclusion. You're like, okay, my left hand feels colder, it must be a lower temperature. That's just your experience that's leading you astray. What it's actually picking up is something called specific heat. Metals have a low specific heat. They're not cold. You're not measuring a temperature difference. You're picking up on a low specific heat. So specific heat is this S here. So if we solve for S, S is Q over M delta T. That thing your brain is picking up when it detects a cold feel of a metal is the heat needed to increase the temperature by one degree Celsius of an object of mass M. So metals have a low specific heat. So if S is low, then this, pro this ratio Q over M delta T is low. Another way to think of it, if we look at the original equation in the box, um, get my eraser working. If we look at this original equation in the box, then for, let's say I take a given mass. So I'm going to compare uh, a one gram piece of nonmetal with a one gram piece of metal. Right. 
So the nonmetal has a high S, the metal has a low S. So if the if I'm looking at one gram sample of each, I can ignore the mass because it's a constant. And then if I actually, it's even clearer if I solve for delta T. Delta T is Q over S. So I'm ignoring M because I'm just going to fix the two samples with the same mass. But for a metal, S is low. So that means it's going to respond. Um, S is low. So that means. Um, what I'm trying to say is not working. Hang on. Give me one second. Let me gather my argument properly. All right. I'm trying to convince you in a very, so far, not satisfactory way. I'm trying to convince you that S is low for metals. So let me let me regroup. All right. I'm actually gonna pick this up. I'm writing on a Surface Pro that's right in front of me. I'm gonna pick it up. You might be looking at my nostrils, but I'm holding it now in my hand. All right. So the S for a metal is typically less than one joule per gram degree C, right? The S for a non-metal is usually greater than one joule per gram degree C. This is what your brain is detecting. This is why you think metals are cold. They're not. It's just a lower specific heat. That means they don't store heat. So heat flows from a, an object that has a higher temperature to an object that has a lower temperature. Both the metal and the fabric that I had a hold of a second ago, they're both in a room that's lower than body temperature, right? So body temperature is approximately 37 degrees. The room temperature is approximately 25, 26 degrees. So obviously, my exp if I'm the system, my experience of the world is that the objects feel cool to the touch. Very quickly, because of the large specific heat of the nonmetal, the nonmetal is going to heat up and eventually it's going to become body temperature. So there'll be a cessation of heat flow to the object that's now the same temperature as my body. However, the metal, because of its low specific heat, doesn't heat up. It just stays at room temperature. And there's a constant temperature gradient that siphons heat away from my hand, but it never really heats the metal up because the metal can't store energy. It's got nowhere to store it. Its specific heat is too low. This lack of an ability of metals to store energy, this is where the idea of a metal being a conductor comes from. They don't store electrical energy. They conduct electrical energy. They transfer it along. Um, this is why we build musical instruments out of metals. If you bang a piece of metal, it will vibrate. If you bang a piece of plastic, it will make a thud because the plastic absorbs the energy. The metal doesn't, it can't, it's got no pockets. There's nowhere for the energy to go. It will vibrate, it will resonate, and we can hear that as an acoustic sound wave. So metals we've known since grade school don't store energy. They, they just pass it along. Um, for that reason, we use it to transfer heat energy to our food. We cook in metals. We use metals to conduct electrical energy in our electricity wires. Again, we build musical instruments all because of this fact that metals don't store energy. Okay. We insulate our world with plastics. We dampen vibrations. We insulate ourselves from electrocution with plastics and nonmetals. We furnish our homes in plastics because they feel warm, because they acquire body temperature. It's pretty uncomfortable to lay on a metal bed. You know, you're going to get cold. But if you lay on a on a wooden, well, not a wooden bed, but if you lay on a fabric bed, that's going to feel more comfortable because the non-metal will acquire body temperature. Um, okay. So um, so yeah, so the specific heat is the heat per unit temperature change for a given mass. Um, 
metals can react very rapidly to a temperature change. They just can't store the energy. So um, that was the point I was trying to get across. They can react rapidly to a temperature change, but they just can't store the energy. Last example, and then we'll move on. This is why if you cook chicken in a piece of aluminum foil, you can put your chicken in aluminum foil in a hot oven. But within seconds of taking the chicken out, you're touching that aluminum foil. You're opening it up to let your chicken steam. And you realize, wow, I've just touched a piece of metal that was 400 degrees. No, you didn't. As soon as you took it out of the oven, it rapidly cooled because it can't store the oven's temperature. Okay. Um, all right. So we've beaten that to death. So let's move on. Oh, did I actually talk about this stuff on the slide? No, after all that, we didn't get to uh, the calculation. So here's just a simple example of using this calculation. We can calculate heat. So uh, a trivial calculation, if a given quantity of heat from a laser is blasted onto a rock of titanium at a given temperature, and it raises the temperature of the rock to another temperature, what's the mass of the metal? Okay, so we've got our equation. We can solve for mass by cross multiplying the equation. And then we just plug the numbers in. Um, the change in temperature is always the final temperature minus the initial temperature. Um, whenever you have a change in temperature, it's fine to leave it in Celsius. The only time you need Kelvin is when you have a temperature. If it's a change, Celsius works. If it was a, just a T rather than a delta T, it would have to be Kelvin. So we've got mass in grams of the object we need. Um, that's what we need to calculate. And I've basically got this Q over S delta T. Well, my Q, uh, my input is kilojoule, so I can convert it to joule. So I've got this 1,000 joule as a kilojoule. This allows me to cancel the unit. There's the black one again. This allows me to cancel. No, it's the black. This allows me to, there we go, cancel the joules. So I have kilojoule. Um, I have my specific heat of titanium. This is something you would look up in a, in a reference book. Um, usually a textbook will have it in an appendix or you know nowadays you can just search for it on the internet. But you would never be expected to predict these values or memorize them. Notice though it's less than one as we would expect in these units. So we have um, S as a denominator. That's why it looks like the units are flipped. And then we have the temperature change, which we can see up here. We can add that. Celsius cancels out. The only unit that won't cancel is grams. So that's our final unit uh, for this calculation. Okay, now it's gonna get interesting. So now we have to talk about state and path functions. So the following assumes that everyone is a good chemist. And I don't mean you, the student, I mean the people that write textbooks. Um, some authors are, let's just say they are cavalier um, with all the love in the world. So, Typically, a capital letter, if we're doing it properly, cap, ital, capital letters, e.g., um, H, V, P, they are state functions. A state function means that the only thing that matters is the final and the initial state. What happens in between is of no consequence. Again, we communicate that it would be in good chemists by using capital letters. The opposite of that are small letters. Now, if we're doing this properly, so, so far you've seen heat and work. They were small letters, right? 
they are path functions. Path functions are path dependent. That means that we can't just assume that the only thing that matters is the final and initial state. The path matters, right? So to give you an example, just a crude example, you know, you live in a certain location, you go to work in a certain location. Your boss doesn't care how you get there. Are you at work or are you not? That's all I care about. I don't care if you took a taxi, if you walked, if you swam, if you got an Uber, if you took a bike, who cares? Did you show up on time, right? The questioning of your employer is state functioning. Are you here? Yes or no? Path, don't care. But the path matters to you, right? If you have to take 17 buses just to get to work versus if I just jump in an Uber and I'm there in 20 minutes, that matters. So sometimes in chemistry, we don't need to know about the path. And we are hinted at that if we see capital letters. So here we've got a capital letter. I know that H is a state function. Here I have a lowercase letter. I know that heat is a path function. Okay, so this is very important to figure out now. Heat is a path function, so I have to worry about the path. Okay, so um, I'm actually going to insert a slide, which is not on the original slides that I gave to my students, but I'm gonna have to insert one. So um, let's see. Insert. No, I need to. Insert a uh, slide right here. Okay. Okay. And let me get the. Okay. So if I plot, I can update these slides for my students as well. If I plot, let's see, what am I going to plot here? I'm going to plot heat Q against the change in temperature, let's say in units of degrees Celsius, right? We're going to get a jagged plot like this. So there's a complicated relationship between heat and temperature change. It's not linear, but it kind of looks linear. It's, it's ziggy zaggy. And we have diagonals. And we have horizontals. Sorry, those little lines, that's where my pinky hit the screen. And my computer's too dumb to know that that was an accident. All right. Hard drawing when you have to suspend your whole hand above the page. All right. So I've got diagonals, I've have horizontals. The diagonals are the pure phases. So solid, liquid, gas. Sorry. The diagonals, not the horizontals. The diagonals are the pure phases. Solid, liquid, gas. The horizontals are the mixtures. So a mixture of a solid and a liquid, a mixture of a liquid and a gas. When I have a diagonal, I use this equation. Q is MS delta T. When I have a horizontal, I use the equation that was on the previous slide. And delta H. Because it's a path function, I have to look at each step along the path separately. So for example, if I take, if I start at X and I go to this point X, what's the heat needed to go from this point here all the way to this point? Okay, so the total heat is gonna be, well, I've got to complete this diagonal. So I've got to use, Let's say, um, you know, I'll use a different color, red. So I've got this much heat, let's call it Q1. Then I've got 
this much heat, let's call it Q2. Then I've got this much heat, let's call it Q3. This much heat, let's call it Q4. And then finally, this much heat, let's call it Q5. I can't just say, look at the end, look at the beginning and take the difference because that would be a state function. I've got to look at every tiny piece of this path. So it's gonna be Q1 plus Q2 plus Q3 plus Q4 plus Q5. I've got to look at every tiny detail. So for Q1, for all my, for all my diagonals, so Q1, Q3 and Q5, I'm using this equation, right? So this is Q1, Q3, Q5. For my horizontals, my Q2 and my Q4, I'm using this equation. Okay, so we've already seen in the first equation, we have heat is mass, specific heat change in temperature. The reason why it's diagonal is because heat in this regime is proportional to temperature change. Notice in the second equation, the horizontal equation, there's no temperature. That's because it's not sensitive to temperature. So um, what's happening here is this equation is a kinetic energy. So I'm converting heat into kinetic energy. Kinetic energy is proportional to temperature. In this regime, the horizontal, I'm converting heat into potential energy. Potential energy has nothing to do with, with temperature. So I'm breaking bonds. So I'm breaking the bonds in my solid and making them slip past each other to form a liquid. Once I've broken all the bonds, then I can heat the liquid up. And then I start to break the bonds in the liquid to form a gas. And I have to fix the temperature while I complete that process before I can start heating the gas up, okay? So this just shows you this nonlinear complicated relationship between heat and temperature change. Because heat is a path function, the path matters. We have to look at every stage on the path. All right, so let's get back to the regular slides. Um, let's see. Okay. So, um, what was it? It was this one, right? It was this one. Yes, it was this one. Okay, so that's where this new equation's coming in from. So here, how many kilocalories of heat are released into the atmosphere when 324 liters of water vapor condense into droplets? We're told that the enthalpy of vaporization, so this is going from the liquid to the gaseous state. So boiling, essentially, we're given a constant value. So we just plug in the numbers. So I know that I need, um, I need my um, kilocalorie. Kilocalorie, I convert that to kilojoules. So a kilocalorie is one, uh, 4.184 kilojoules. So if I look at my units, and I've got the kilojoule cancels here, and I've got units of kilocalorie, then I know it's kilojoule per mole. So I cancel mole here with water. Water has a formula weight of 18.01. I can cancel this mass with the density of water. So water at 25 degrees, I'm gonna assume has a, a gram mass in a milliliter volume. So milliliter here, I convert milliliter to liter using the metric conversion. And then my input is in liter. So the only unit that survives is kilocalorie and I have a total value of kilocalorie. Okay, heats of reaction. So again, when you do a chemical process, you can either generate heat or consume heat. So we can add that equality into a regular stoichiometric calculation. 
So for example, here we have how much energy is released when 75 grams of sugar are combusted. And we're told that the enthalpy of combustion is a given value. So I have my equality here. I have my equality here. Um, I know I'm told that the enthalpy of combustion is minus 565 by 10 to the 3 kilojoule per mole. That means one mole releases. That's what the negative means. It releases that much energy. Okay, well then, how many moles do you have? Well, I know that a mole of sucrose is the formula weight of sucrose in grams. So I add up all these elements from the periodic table, combine the masses together, I get 342.30. But my input today was only 75 grams. So the grams cancel, the mole cancels, and I'm left with kilojoule. So about 1,200 kilojoules of energy are released. And I can use that energy to climb a tree, to learn chemistry, to do whatever I want, to procrastinate if I choose to. Um, OK. If ever you see a symbol like this, it means standard conditions. Now, unfortunately, because when people invented this stuff, they didn't really care how hard it was to learn. You know, um, it was all convention at the time. So standard means different things in different contexts in chemistry. In thermochemistry contexts, standard means 25 degrees Celsius. And, um, and one atmospheric pressure. Okay. Um, do, yeah, we can look at that. Okay, a bomb calorimeter is a constant volume calorimeter. constant volume. So the change in volume is zero. We call this isochoric conditions. So constant volume, isochoric conditions. The reason why we just have heat is internal energy. Remember, we said that the change in internal energy is heat plus work. That was the first law of thermodynamics. We also said that work is defined as minus pressure times by change in volume. Well, now I'm telling you under these conditions, change in volume is zero. So that cancels work out. So we're left with heat is just total internal energy. So that's where this is coming from. Okay, so heat is just total internal energy under constant volume conditions. A bomb calorimeter is how they measure energy content of food. So for example, if you're eating a snack bar and it says 300 calories, how do they know it's 300 calories? Well, they get the snack bar, they dip it in liquid oxygen. So it's completely saturated with oxygen. And then they put it inside a bomb calorimeter, which is like a reinforced thick steel walled coffee maker. It's about the same size as a coffee machine. You put it in with liquid oxygen, liquid environment, freezing cold, but 100% oxygen environment. And then you set fire to it. You set fire to it and it has a metal wall, but within the metal wall, there's a, a, a water jacket, like a water reservoir. As the fire of the explosion heats the metal, the metal heats the water, you measure the temperature increase in the water, and then you apply Q as MS delta T, and you can calculate the heat generated by the object. So that's how they figure out the nutrition value. You know, how do they know a salad from Cheesecake Factory has 3000 calories? How, how's that even possible? But how do they know? They freeze a salad from the cheesecake factory in liquid oxygen, put it in a bomb calorimeter and set fire to it. And it, gener it generates 3000 calories of heat. That's how they know. Um, 
Okay, so um, so here's a question. Let me get rid of my scribbles. If 6.805 grams of sucrose are combusted in a bomb calorimeter, the heat capacity of the bomb calorimeter, this is basically the heat needed just to heat the, the instrument up. So it's the heat conversion that you have to pay. So basically, you've got to pay 15.4 joules of heat every time you want the water temperature to go by one degree Celsius. So that's just what's needed to heat the machine up. Okay. So that's the heat capacity of the machine. Then what's the energy released by the sugar? Uh, okay. So we have this equation. This looks new, but it's really a new way of writing an old equation. So we, our old equation is Q is MS delta T. Now here, MS is just something called heat capacity. So MS is just capital C, the heat capacity. Um, because of conservation of mass, the heat gained by the instrument, the calorimeter, Q cal just means calorimeter, is the heat lost <clears throat> by the combustion reaction. So conservation of energy, as the fuel loses heat, the machine or the bomb calorimeter gains heat. So this is just the statement of conservation of energy. Um, we've got the temperature change from the question. Okay, now we're ready to plug the numbers in. Um, so we want the enthalpy change for the calorimeter. Okay, so we have um, the formula weight of glucose in grams. So uh, a mole of sucrose, sorry, sucrose, not glucose. A mole of sucrose is the mass of all the elements in units of grams, so we get that number 342.3. Um, that's our input. We've got a temperature change of 7.3 degrees. And we have the heat capacity of the machine. So the heat capacity of the machine is this value here. Um, so the units that we're left with, if Celsius cancels, we're left with joule per mole, we can convert that to kilojoule. I guess we have done here, we've converted kilojoule, uh, joule to kilojoule. So we actually have kilojoule per mole. So this would generate um, 5.7 kilojoule per mole. Now, fun fact, not necessary, not necessary, but a fun fact, a food calorie is a capital C calorie. This is actually equal to a kilojoule, uh, no, it's not it's equal to a kilocalorie and a kilocalorie is 4184 joules. So if we wanted to convert this, this kilojoule to food calories, we would have to, uh, so that's in kilojoules. So I just have to divide by 4184. Let me open my calculator. So 5700 divided by. So about one calorie, one food calorie. Uh, if I've done that right off the top of my head. Without without doing a unit line equation, I might have butchered it. This is this is true. Okay, so food calories on food labels they are they are multiples thousands of joules. Um, so we have to be careful. Anyway, it's more anecdotal because we're not interested in food calories in Chem sixty five. We have enough to worry about. Okay, so that's a bomb calorimeter. A coffee cup calorimeter is open to the atmosphere. So this is literally just two styrofoam cups. It's open at the top, um, constant pressure, not constant volume. Now under constant pressure conditions, um, it's a bit complicated to show you at the Chem 65 level. You just, I'd ask you to take my word for it. Under constant pressure conditions, 
they might be in one of my videos I post, but I'm certainly not going to go through it here because it takes too long. Um, under constant pressure conditions, we call these isobaric conditions. When the change in pressure is zero, then we can say that heat and enthalpy are the same. So heat is still a path function. Enthalpy is still a state function, but they become numerically equivalent under isobaric conditions. Okay, so if a given mass of aluminum metal at a given temperature is dropped in a given mass of water at a given temperature, what's the specific heat of aluminum? So we have our equation, but now we know that, again, because of conservation of energy, the loss of heat of the aluminum, as the aluminum cools, it's going to heat up the water, right? So conservation of energy, the loss of heat by the hot aluminum leads to the gain of heat by the cool water. So that's why we've got this negative sign here and we've got the positive sign here. So the negative MS delta T of the aluminum is the positive MS delta T of the water. We just isolate uh, the S for aluminum, which is this guy here. So we cross multiply, bring the M delta T down to the, to the side here. And then we just plug the numbers in. We're expecting a value less than one because it's a metal and we get a value less than one. Okay. Do we, uh, yeah, we should worry about this a little bit. Uh, okay. Let's see what the last slide is. Oops. Yeah, we can worry about this a little bit. This is definitely a bit, um, maybe a little bit, something we don't have to worry that much about. Um, yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll mention, actually, do you know what I'll do? Because I've got about five minutes left and I think this is gonna take more than five minutes. I'm going to do this in a second video that I'll record a bit later today and I'll post it separate for my students um, because I don't want to rush this. It deserves um, me being a bit slow with it and I, I, there's no way I can do it in five minutes. So uh, for my students, everything that's in this video so far is the basic idea. So watch this, look at the extra video, a couple of videos I'll post on YouTube. And then I'll do an extra video on actually calculating heat according to Hess's law and bond enthalpy because it, it deserves more than five minutes. Okay, so Dr. Ross, over and out.